Hello and welcome to Nursing Care of Traumatic Brain Injury. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk a little bit about traumatic brain injury. First of all, it helps to kind of visualize as you talk about these different injuries, what part of the brain is involved in the process of the traumatic brain injury. So let's take a look at some of those different functional areas to begin with. When we're looking at the brain, of course, one of the big areas there in the front is the frontal lobe. This is responsible for our thinking, our speaking, reasoning, problem solving, those kind of activities. The temporal lobe is more concerned with memories, hearing, behavior, and a generation of emotions from the temporal lobe. The brain stem, on the other hand, is concerned with breathing, temperature, heart rate, so those are autonomic type of uh, things that are happening in our body. Our cellar cerebellum is concerned with coordination, balance, and attention. The occipital lobe, vision, of course, and then the parietal lobe, kind of sitting there in between some of these, is for reading, body orientation, sensory information, and understanding language. Now, if we have injury to a specific part of the brain, we may lose some of these qualities. In addition, of course, we can't separate out all of these different areas of the brain entirely because they are connected to each other and they are all contained within the skull. So let's start with our skull fractures. The type of skull fracture and the amount of underlying damage is going to depend upon where the fracture is. We'll get back to this a little bit later here talking about the different facial bone fractures, but Keep in mind that the skull, as you take a look at it here, especially in the picture on the left, you can see that nice arc type shape and rounded shape to the skull. There's a specific reason for that. An arc will hold more weight and is less likely to become damaged than a flat surface would be. So this arc of the skull is going to help it to be able to absorb impact and be able to protect the brain much better than it would if we had a square head, okay? So uh, keep that in mind. Now, those bones in the front, and one of the reasons I showed you this picture here, is those facial bones are going to be more likely to fracture. They're, they're thinner, they're smaller, so they're more likely to fracture than would be maybe the top of the skull. Skull fractures and the type of damage that will occur to our patient will depend upon the mass. So the larger the mass that's hitting the skull, the more internal injury we'd expect to see. And, you know, I keep talking about the internal injury with a skull fracture. That's the primary problem we have to worry about with skull fractures is both the internal injury to the brain, not so much the skull fracture itself. You know, you fracture your arm. That's a pretty big deal. You want to try and fix that fracture, and you're more concerned with the bone there. Here, we're not as concerned with the bone. We're concerned more about what's happening underneath and the damage to the brain. Also, we have to be concerned about the cervical spine, since the cervical spine is supporting the head. And if we had enough of a damage, enough of a trauma that it caused the brain or cause the skull to be fractured, then we have to be concerned that maybe the cervical spine is also injured. So the mass, the shape of the object. So, you know, here you see the ball hitting uh, the front of the patient's skull and it could cause some bruising to the brain, etc. Not as likely that because of that rounded shape and because it's going to give a little bit, it's not as likely that it's going to cause a skull fracture. However, you see in the picture on the left, a brick and the point of the brick coming down. So that shape is going to be more likely probably to cause a skull fracture. The velocity, the momentum, and we used to see a lot more facial fractures and skull fractures uh, prior to having mandated seatbelts in cars and airbags in cars. We would see a lot of them from those, uh, from motor vehicle accidents. But now we're seeing the primary mechanism of skull fractures is going to be from trauma that's inflicted by other people. In this case here, so this is a case of a gentleman called Phineas Gage, and Phineas Gage was a railroad worker. 
One day when he was working on the railroad, someone uh, shot off one of these explosions a little bit early. So they used to use these big uh, pipes, and you see this tube or this pipe that he has in his hand. It's not a tube. It's a solid piece of uh, iron. And it comes to a point on the one end, and they would drive this into the ground in order to make holes to put their dynamite into to uh, blow up the you know, side of a mountain or whatever so they could run the railroad through well one of these happened to be in the ground apparently and somebody uh, shot off a uh, explosion a little bit too early and phineas happened to be in the way well that thing is about three and a half feet long and it's about an inch and a half thick that uh, pipe that he's holding there that um, piece of metal that piece of metal shot up underneath his left eye and shot out through the top of his skull now you can see he is posing here in a picture. Obviously he's alert and obviously he's alive and he's posing here in a picture with that piece of metal that shot through his head. So this was in the 1800s and that thing shot through his head and left a, a big old hole through his frontal lobe. Well, what they found was that in uh, when he recovered from this injury, and he did, he recovered. He had you know, a big um, piece of his skull that was missing, etc. But he went on to live for about another 12 years after this injury occurred. However, he had a dramatic change in his personality. And you see, that makes a lot of sense when we're looking at those different areas of the brain and we look at the frontal lobe responsible for a personality and some of those thought processes. So it makes a lot of sense that he had this dramatic behavior change and he really had a hard time uh, being able to continue to work etc after this injury uh, but he carried that uh, that piece of metal with him everywhere he went it was kind of his lucky piece of metal i guess because it didn't kill him <laughs> you know with skull fractures we want to first make sure that we're controlling the bleeding because obviously the skull is going to be a very vascular area so controlling the bleeding assessing for underlying brain injury including bleeding and edema that could be happening within the skull and causing pressure on the brain a skull x-ray is one way to be able to assess for skull fractures certainly it's going to help us to find a skull fracture but the ct scan is really going to be a lot more useful because we also get the benefit of being able to see the brain and the underlying structures a facial fracture is a subtype of a skull fracture one of the main priorities that we need to be aware of with a facial fracture is the airway. So when you look at these pictures here, these are the different Lefort classifications of facial fractures. And you can see that they all involve the face and, and specifically they're involving the areas around the mouth and the upper airway. So this could really cause a big problem for our upper airway, both from having bony fragments or soft tissue swelling and bleeding that could be obstructing the airway. We want to be assessing for underlying injuries to some of the other uh, organs, et cetera, and to the brain, any of these pieces of uh, facial bone that may be protruding into the brain. Surgery may be necessary, so they're going to do a CT scan here, look at where those bones are and whether or not the bones are going to be able to heal on their own or whether we need to take this patient to surgery to be able to place the bones back in the correct place. Another subset of skull fractures is a basal skull fracture. And this is showing, the picture on the right is showing the raccoon eyes uh, that can occur from a basal skull fracture. So this is the base of the skull, which is holding the bottom of the brain in place. And if we have a basal skull fracture, uh, we have to be careful that the patient is not developing edema here because the base of the skull is where we have the brain stem. And if we get swelling or bleeding that is starting to impinge on the brain stem, then the patient is going to stop breathing and stop having a heart rate. We do have several layers of protection for the brain though. And so when the patient has some kind of head trauma, we have the skin, we have the uh, underlying adipose tissue, and then we have the bone, obviously the skull, and then we have the dura mater. The dura mater is a very thick and tough outer covering of the brain, and then the arachnoid membrane, and finally the pia mater. So there's several layers of protection for the brain that helps to keep the brain in place and also helps to protect the brain from trauma.
When we take a look at the different kinds of bleeds that can occur in our patient, uh, this is showing two of them here, the epidural bleed and the subdural bleed. As you might imagine from their name, the epidural bleed is a bleed that's happening above the dura. So it's between the dura and the skull. In this case here over on the left-hand side of the diagram, it's showing that epidural bleed caused by a skull fracture. Typically this happens in the area of the temporal bone and it oftentimes is rapidly expanding because it's arterial. So we do want to be aware of the difference between an epidural and a subdural bleed because an epidural bleed will tend to form faster and under higher pressure so it could cause the patient to have severe problems. Symptom-wise, we'd expect that an epidural bleed, one of the kind of the classic presentations of an epidural is the patient loses consciousness with the initial trauma, regains consciousness, and then loses consciousness again. Now, when you think about a patient who has a head trauma and loses consciousness, we think about it as being a concussion. However, people, when they recover from a concussion, when they become awake again, they don't lose consciousness again. That's not part of our post-concussive syndrome, right? That might be typical, though, of an epidural bleed. So we'd want to be careful. We want to be watching that uh, this is a possibility for that patient. Now, a subdural bleed is occurring below the dura. This is typically venous, and it's going to form slower and over a longer period of time. There's three different types of subdurals. There's an acute subdural that happens within minutes. There is a subacute that happens within hours, so within the first 24 hours or so of the injury. And then there's a chronic subdural that happens over a period of days or weeks. And that might happen because somebody tripped and fell. And then over a period of the next week, they start having more and more severe symptoms. With either of these, an epidural or a subdural, they may be evacuated. In most cases, it's going to depend upon how fast it's forming and how big and localized that bleed is so that we can pull that blood out. If we're bleeding directly into the brain tissue itself, that's called an intracerebral bleed. Oftentimes, this affects the frontal and temporal lobes. Uh, the bleeding can, unfortunately, because we're bleeding right into the brain tissue, it can start to cause pressure on the brain, and that can decrease our blood flow. So it's going to start squeezing those blood vessels, decreasing blood flow, and can cause herniation. That's what we're seeing here. So we have an intracerebral bleed that's occurring in this patient, and because of both pressure, swelling, etc., we are completely closed off the ventricle on the right. So you see that little black line there, that little black uh, piece on the left, that's the ventricle. And we should have another black spot on the right, but it's completely closed off because of pressure that has formed. You can also see that we're kind of moving that midline over toward the left as well, and the brain is herniating in this case here from that intracerebral bleed. So our nursing care is we want brief and reliable neural checks on our patient so that we know what's going on. Brief, okay, so the longer that we stimulate this patient, the higher the intracranial pressure is gonna go. So we wanna be careful we're not doing these long drawn out neural checks on our patient, but we do want them to be reliable. So we wanna make sure that we are assessing and making sure that the patient is not having changes in their condition. Balance our oxygen supply and demand so that we're getting enough oxygen to the brain, but decreasing the demand of the brain. So you may have to put your patient on supplemental oxygen, or we may have to put them in a position of comfort so they're better able to breathe. At the same time, we wanna decrease the demand of the brain. Well, guess what the number one thing is that's causing a demand on the brain? Probably our neuro checks, okay? So the nursing interventions we do for our patient, turning, positioning, ambulate, all of those things are going to increase the brain's demand for oxygen. So we want to be careful about how we are doing our care for our patient so that we're not increasing the demand by the brain for oxygen and maybe not balancing our oxygen supply and demand. Decompression may be necessary, so they may take out a piece of the skull in order to be able to let the pressure inside the skull be released. Uh, also intracranial pressure monitoring, and in some cases you see the different types of devices here on the right. The uh, ventricular device it goes all the way down in the ventricle, and with that and some of the other devices, we can actually remove some of the CSF, and that will help to decrease our intracranial pressure too.
Well, if you're in a critical care nurse, I would certainly encourage you to become certified as a critical care nurse. If you'd like to know more about how to become certified as a critical care nurse, check out thenursingprof.com. We have a critical care nursing certification review program that will help you to achieve this goal. It includes test taking tips, study strategies, and guaranteed success. Check it out at thenursingprof.com. Thank you for joining me for Nursing Care of Traumatic Brain Injury. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, 